a few reflections about the great feast of the Epiphany. When the three kings, the three wise men, they traveled from the Orient and they followed a star uh, to Bethlehem with a stop in Jerusalem to, with the king, King Herod. But they followed the star from the Orient to Bethlehem via Jerusalem. Use your imagination for just a minute. I think many people have a misconception about these kings. It would not have been three kings all starting from the same country. You wouldn't have three kings over the same country. It'd be like having three presidents of the United States. So probably what would have happened is this. You had three kings, all of whom would have been astrologers, and they would have seen this unusual celestial phenomenon, this star in the sky, and all of them would have started to follow it, but from three different countries. And at some point in the journey, they all do what? Because they're all following the same star, going to the same place, they all join. They all join together, and then they proceed together. Probably that's what occurred. It wouldn't have been where three of them all start out in the same country, where you have three kings of the same country. Perhaps, I think no one knows for sure, but I think the explanation that I just gave you is the most, li most likely one. Use your imagination, will you? Imagine a king. A king never travels alone. They travel, especially 2,000 years ago. They would have elephants and camels and dromedaries and horses and soldiers. And, uh, and you have three of them, three of these caravans. And at some point, all three of these caravans would join together and you have the kings of the earth from the Orient, the kings of the earth, marching to meet the king of kings and to pay homage to the one who is king of kings, king of kings. Now, these three kings who came from the Orient, they were not Jews, obviously. They didn't live in Israel. They didn't live in Palestine. These people were not Jews. And so what you have is, is you have those who are the Gentiles, the non-Jews traveling to meet and to worship the newborn king. Now, if you look at any crib scene, any crib scene, what you really have portrayed is, is you have the three kings who represent the non-Jewish world, the non-Jewish world. As a matter of fact, all of us are represented by those three kings, the non-Jewish world. And then you have the shepherd. You just have one little shepherd boy here in the front. But you have the shepherds. The shepherds were Jews. The shepherds were Jews. And they were shepherds in Bethlehem. So these were Jewish people. So the first, other than Mary and Joseph, to worship Jesus were the Jews, and they're represented in the person of that shepherd boy. So you have Jesus in the middle. Then you have the shepherd boy who represents the Jews. And then you have these three kings who represent the non-Jewish world. And so you have Jesus who is king of kings, lord of lords, being worshipped by whom? Everyone. The Jews and the non-Jews. And the non-Jews. This feast is called Epiphany. Epiphany. You know what the word means? It means like a manifestation or a revelation where something is revealed to you which previously had been hidden. And so what you have is you have the divinity of Jesus Christ revealed now to the non-Jewish world. The divinity of Jesus Christ revealed to the non-Jews. And this why, that's why it's called Epiphany, because his divinity is shown to them and they come to understand it. I've often tried to think about being uh, like a, a resident of Bethlehem, some little town. I've been there a couple times, a little town Bethlehem, you know, and into your town there come three caravans all joined together, all joined together. Elephants, camels, dromedaries, horses, soldiers, people with turbans. Um, you know, in the, in the Far East, in the Orient, instead of carrying a straight sword that you fight with, they don't carry straight swords. What would they have in their belt? It would be called a scimitar a scimitar, which is a curved sword. And so you have three caravans all come together and they all travel into this little town of Bethlehem 
and above them is a star, and above them is a star. It's a beautiful thought, beautiful thought to think about, quite frankly. The three kings, everybody brings a gift, three different gifts. These are the gifts. Please listen. The three kings each bring a gift. One king brings gold. Gold is a gift for a king. Gold is a gift for a king. Many times you will see kings, and they're seated on a golden throne. And for their crown, they'll have what? A golden crown, a golden crown. So the first gift is gold, a gift for a king. The second gift is frankincense, or incense. The second gift is incense. Incense is a gift for a priest. When you walked into the church today, you smell incense. Incense is a gift for a priest. Many times in the Mass, if you were here over Christmas, the priest will use incense. The priest offers sacrifice on behalf of the people. He uses incense and offers sacrifice on behalf of the people. So gold for a king, Jesus is a king. Incense for a priest, a priest is one who offers sacrifice. And then the most unusual gift of all is myrrh. You know what myrrh is? You ever uh, think about that a bit? You know what it is? Myrrh is a Middle Eastern burial spice. A Middle Eastern burial spice. And what they would do is, is when someone would die, they would anoint the body with this sweet-smelling, fragrant myrrh. Myrrh. Why in the world would you give a burial spice to a newborn baby? Why would you do that? You have the little bitty baby, and they bring him burial, uh, the spice for burial, for burial. You know what that means? Like I told you, gold for a king, two, incense for a priest, the priest who offers sacrifice. Let me ask you a question. And the sacrifice that will be offered will be himself. Himself. And that's the myrrh. The sacrifice that he offers is his own self, his own body. He came to die for you. And so these three kings are... Uh, Three kings and their three gifts tell us about Christ. He's a king, he's a priest who offers sacrifice, and the sacrifice that he offers is himself, is, his, is himself that he offers for each, for each of us. In the gospel that we just read, it says this, On entering the house, the three kings saw the child with Mary. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. I've often thought about that, where you got three kings and they have these turbans on or they have crowns on. They're wearing the finest robes, probably made of silk, made of silk, something like that. You can look at how beautifully they're dressed, they're made of silk or something like that. And Jesus is in a stable and now you have three kings <laughs> face down on a stable floor in front of Christ, three kings. It's similar to, to you when you come into this church when you genuflect. It's, you, you, did you ever think of this? The same God that those three kings were prostrate in front of is the same God here. And when you come in, it's like you imitate to some degree the same gesture of those kings. Only what happens instead of you going prostrate, what you do is you genuflect. And then in the pew, what will happen is you will kneel. So you kneel or genuflect before the, before the one who is king of kings, the same way that those three kings actually went prostrate on the floor of a stable. Also, in regard to them, on the floor of the stable, they were kings. Do you know the other thing which is symbolized by that? With those three kings, those three rulers of those nations, kings of three nations, you know what else that symbolizes? is that all the rulers of the world, all rulers of the world, should be what before Christ? Obedient to him and to his laws. Imagine how different the world would be if all kings were like these three who traveled from afar, following a star, to worship Christ. So many of the rulers of the world today, the kings, they are not obedient to Christ at all. They do not follow him. They do not search for him. They do exactly, exactly the, uh, the opposite. Sometimes we call these three kings wise men. 
Why do we call him wise? I looked up the word wise. <clears throat> Wisdom. Wisdom means this. Wisdom is the ability to judge what is true and what is right. Wisdom is the ability to judge what is true and what is right. We call them wise because their primary search was for God who is truth. That's why we call them wise. If you have people and they spend their whole life and they search for stuff which the world values, which is ephemeral and which just passes away like dust, like dust, they are not wise. You have so many people and all they do is they chase what the world values. They chase power, they ch uh, chase a pleasure, uh, they chase a status, they chase possessions, and it all vanishes. Wisdom is where you pursue and where your life's journey is to find God who is truth and to worship Him not for those other things. It's an interesting reflection sometimes, if you get a minute, maybe tonight if you've got a minute, and to ask yourself what you yearn for most. That's a very good question. What do you yearn for most in life? If you're honest with yourself about that, you will find the trajectory of your life. Your whole life is answering that question, and all the decisions that you make it's like a thread that weaves throughout your life is where you're trying to get that which you yearn for most, most. Lots and lots of people in America in a capitalistic, materialistic society like the United States, they yearn for those things that I just mentioned. Wealth, possessions, pleasure, power, status. And their whole life is guided by that, by that. They're not after God or truth. They're not out to try to do what is the will of God and to be obedient to his law. But that's a very good reflection sometimes, is to ask yourself, what do you yearn for most? And that's why we call them wise. They would risk anything, these three guys, three kings. They risk anything to find God who is, who is the truth, who is the truth. The three kings each brought a gift, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What do you bring? It's a very good question, too. Each person should bring a gift. When they come to Mass, each person should bring a gift. And I'll tell you what the gift is that he wants from you. He wants the same thing from each person. Same thing. You know what it is? He wants your heart. And he wants all of it. He doesn't want any half-hearted Christians. He wants all of it. All of your heart. So many times now we have find people who want to give him some of their heart. They're half-hearted, half-hearted worshipers. It's like with one part of their heart, they're, they're devout Christians, but with another part of their heart, they're not. It's like they try to straddle, like one foot in the Christian world and one foot in the world, one foot in Christianity, one foot in the world, and they, they try to straddle it. They don't give their whole heart, their whole heart. The, the teenagers, they say it this way, they say, dudes, it's easy to talk to talk, but it's hard to walk to walk. There are lots of people who talk to Christian talk, but they don't walk to Christian walk. But that's what Christ wants from you. He wants all of your heart. I want to say it another way. He wants your love, and he wants all of it, wants all of it. The three kings, they traveled over deserts, over mountains, <laughs> everywhere to find Christ. Nowadays, people won't come to church if it's raining. Uh, it's interesting to think about that. Uh, what would the three kings say to them? You would say to the kings, well, it's raining. I better not come. And they would say, we three kings of Orient are traveled over field and fountain, mountain. <laughs> we traveled over all these things. And for you, it's raining. For you, it's raining. It's interesting to look at what you're willing to suffer for Christ and what you're willing to endure for him, to endure for him. Uh, lots of people nowadays, you know, <clears throat> they will struggle so hard to get an education. Nothing wrong with that. Struggle so hard to succeed at work. Nothing wrong with that. They will struggle so hard to be good athletes. Nothing wrong with that. When it comes to being a Christian, mediocre, mediocre, mediocre Christians. 
Not mediocre at business, not mediocre at sports, not mediocre when it comes to pleasure in our vacations, but when it comes to, when it comes to Christianity and following him and his law, we are mediocre, mediocre. I think the three kings that teach us what it means to sacrifice for Christ and to search for him as the primary love, the primary love of your life. One final thought. The three kings, they followed a star. In order to <clears throat> see a star, it has to be dark. It has to be dark outside. You won't see the star. If I told you that now, in this present time of history, there are a lot of people in the dark, would you buy it? That's true. There are a lot of people afraid, a lot of people sick, a lot of people alone, a lot of people struggling financially, a lot of people suffering from not only physical but mental illness, a lot of people in the dark, amigos, a lot of people in the dark. But you know what they need? They need a star. They need a star. They need you to bring some light into the darkness of their lives. They need you. You be the star and bring some light into the darkness of people's lives. And then what ends up happening is it's like you bring Christ to them. Because when you bring light, when you bring love, when you bring peace, when you bring truth, it's like you bring Christ, bring Christ. You will never see a star unless it's dark, unless it's dark. So you must be the star and come into the darkness of people's lives. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Ghost. Amen.